Very good. Okay. Thank you very much indeed, Tim. And uh, it, it's very good to be here uh, once again. Um, uh, yes, so uh, along with uh, yeah, Jonathan, Alex and I work at the, uh, you, uh, uh, the branch of uh, the Consumer Data Research Centre uh, based in UCL, Liverpool and Oxford. And uh, we also have colle colleagues based at the uh, University of Leeds. And <clears throat> perhaps to, make, um, uh, to begin with a link to the, uh, uh, what Jonathan was saying about uh, skills and uh, yeah, education... Uh, I want to begin with just uh, with sort of tempering some of the enthusiasm that we yeah, yeah, uh, we uh, have for the data science, new methods, new techniques, new data sources, with um, a couple of uh, I suppose sort of geotemporal problems uh, and uh, reflecting on our um, uh, uh, our seeming inabilities uh, to deal with them. Uh, the first one uh, is here, and it's, uh, uh, it's basically uh, an example which um, uh, Alex has mocked up using the um, Scottish uh, Index of Multiple Deprivation and the uh, ONS uh, um, uh, Output Area Classification for 2011, which was uh, created uh, uh, by us at uh, CDRC. And revisiting an example that... Um, um, I've pummeled uh, over sort of several editions of uh, the textbook you see in the bottom right-hand corner that's uh, paid quite a healthy chunk of my mortgage uh, over the years. And the example re uh, actually relates to um, a, case, a, a case study highlighted by uh, uh, Sir Michael Marmot at, the, uh, uh, at UCL in a World Health Organization report uh, published in 2009 which uses the example which uh, Alex has um, uh, um, revived using uh, the CDRC uh, MAPS website that you'll hear more about uh, in his slot of the presentation. And it's the, it's the seeming sort of paradox of you know, the geographical analysis that uh, um, uh, we, we seem to have more data, uh, but we don't seem to come any closer to actually understanding what's going on and understanding long-term outcomes. And the example uh, from uh, the WHO report in 2009 concerns the eight-mile distance that con connects the Colton, an uh, uh, inner-city location in uh, Glasgow, uh, with the suburban community of Lenzi, which you can see here, uh, connected by uh, 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 the shortest road distance. A distance of, as, as I say, about eight miles, which uh, spans a life expectancy of uh, 58 uh, in the Coulton and 82 in Lenzi. Um, and despite you know, uh, various, uh, uh, lots of different data sources and so forth, we seem to come no nearer to explaining these sorts of problems than saying, well... I wish I knew where I was going to die. Why? Well, I wouldn't go there. You know, sort of, uh, 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 our, our seeming inability uh, to understand the dynamics that underpin location and place uh, doesn't seem to, it doesn't seem to uh, improve as the data horizon uh, broadens when we look at long-term wicked problems such as life expectancy. But it ain't too good, you know, sort of even over the short term. As a, uh, this is a quote I lifted from um, uh, 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 somebody who works for YouGov uh, uh, in The Economist you know, a couple of months ago. And it reflects that you know, in 1992, opinion pollsters, I think you remember that was the, um, the election where the, it was the Sun what won it. Um, uh, um, opinion pollsters all use the same methods. They all ask the same questions and they all got it wrong. Um, by 2015, um, they'd become much more sophisticated. They'd use focus groups, they'd use social media, they use different nuanced questions, they use different channels, they use different uh, statistical methods. In fact, the only thing that united them is they all got it wrong again. Um, and so there is a yeah, yeah, paradox here, as I say, that the, um, we're, we're sort of seeing the receding horizon, ever and ever richer data um, uh, uh, representations, but seeming inability to uh, convert them to, um, uh, convert them to 
um, a, a, a sustainable insight. To shift now then to a couple of sort of you know, some reflections on uh, the world that Jonathan, uh, Alex and I inhabit in uh, academia and uh, to perhaps reflect on some possible uh, reasons for them. It was interesting in you know, David Willits' um, presentation that he presented you know, a lot of uh, data, for example, from the Labour Force Survey and uh, other uh, central government surveys. Um, this graph, which um, uh, we hoodwinked out of, um, um, uh, I think it's a legacy ONS uh, website now, uh, 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 looking at responses to uh, uh, freedom of information requests, um, actually sort of documents the uh, uh, approximate 10 percentage point fall in response rates to official government surveys uh, over a 10-year over a period. And, um, you don't really need to go much further than personal anecdote to understand the motivations of this. Probably half the people in this room declined to take part in some kind of survey or you know, a, a, a online uh, a, um, a, a survey <coughs> instrument uh, during their trip you know, a, 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 to this conference. I know certainly, I mean, if you look in the world of uh, response rates to review uh, journal articles, uh, um, uh, journal editors now, for example, have to send... Uh, stuff out to many more people in the hope of getting enough, uh, e enough responses. So there's an element of secular response uh, 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 fatigue, uh, which uh, uh, I think we can argue is now sufficiently pronounced that it's impossible to think of the future of social science relying upon conventional social survey instruments al alone particularly when you go to surveys such as the Labour Force Survey, when repeated waves of uh, 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 responses are elicited from individuals that have differential uh, propensities to remain in the survey, and those that opt out are in no sense um, a, a, a representative of those that uh, remain, uh, remain in. I started with one slide from, uh, from the textbook. This is another slide which uh, perhaps sort of uh, refre reflects on changing social science practices and you know, certainly we see manifest in the sorts of student projects that um, uh, uh, um, enter our master's uh, dissertation uh, competition. And that is um, a generation ago, uh, the linear survey design was about Devise, uh, identifying your sample frame, uh, taking your sample, uh, soliciting uh, your responses, checking that the response rate was uh, acceptable, uh, resampling as necessary, and then uh, inferring from samples to populations. Inferring from samples, every element of which had a known or pre and pre-specified chance of selection, as you can see in these uh, the, uh, 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 in these different uh, designs on the slide. Uh, today's uh, 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 today's recruits to academia um, almost invariably download data off the internet in uh, some way, and are much more likely to use uh, data sources like this. You know, sort of basically. I don't know, to, uh, to stereotype the, the world of academia. 20 years ago, uh, academics got excited by census data long after uh, census data uh, uh, and did rather boring things with census data. Now they do rather boring things with Twitter data. Um, you know, what are we actually looking at there? You know, it's a, it's a, it's a very nice image. But we're we looking at the geography of uh, workplace activities, the geography of the journey to, uh, to work, uh, the geography of people on holiday, the ge geography of people in their residences. Probably the only thing that you can be confident of to any degree uh, is that you're looking uh, at the geography of narcissism, people who, uh, uh, who uh, want to project their uh, um, uh, views and opinions that quite possibly are unrepresentative of those that keep, uh, keep stum. So that's really the, you know, the, basic, uh, you know, the basic background, I think, you know, when we come to think about um, uh, uh, what the, the Estonian presidency recently sort of heralded as the, the, uh, the push towards the fifth freedom within the EU, the free, uh, the free movement of data. 
we're actually moving to a situation where, in actual fact, people talk about big data being about uh, hubris and you know, sort of you know, over grandiose expectations. But a sober look um, in the morning light does tell us that, um, that the secular decline in social survey uh, results to say nothing of the, pre the pressures on uh, 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 collecting and commissioning social surveys uh, mean that it's very difficult to envisage a future for social science in the UK or internationally that doesn't have some big data component to it because there has to be some way uh, in which um, new sources of data can be used to shore up uh, the existing infrastructure, and I'll come back to that term in a minute, uh, it provided by uh, uh, social survey uh, measurement I I instruments. And uh, um, uh, groups like Doug and uh, meetings like today are important because what the people, what everyone in this room shares is an interest in consumer data which account for ever-increasing real shares uh, of the data that are uh, collected and assembled uh, about, us, uh, about us as uh, citizens. And there's a need for, uh, 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 for a, a, a change in pace of data collection uh, because, in many respects, society has become much more complex in terms of activity patterns, um, social trajectories, as we heard in the, uh, 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 the opening uh, uh, speech, uh, and so on and so forth, uh, than it was before. Um, and many of the retailers uh, in this room will be particularly vexed by the challenges of 24-hour uh, uh, cities and so on and so forth. Data sources then have changed, so also uh, have uh, uh, the nature, uh, 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 the forms that data take and the way that they're, they're accessed. And that's also another sort of uh, 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 element of the zeitgeist of uh, uh, social science research practice, that um, although academics would like to envisage a future where all data are open, the reality is that the behemoths of the internet age, the alphabets, the apples, the Amazons, the Facebooks, the, uh, 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 the Microsofts, uh, are fundamentally intent upon creating data silos, creating and internalizing data silos uh, you know, for the, the vast majority uh, of their activities. And where, and that's the that's the that's the that's the problem that data sharing faces in a range of a range of walks of life, and one in which CDRC, working along with Doug and other partners, has been reasonably successful on breaking down those barriers and and encouraging data mining to have more expansive horizons in terms of uh, looking at the uh, range and nature of data sources that can be looked at uh, and accessed using different methods. So this is a, a, a slide of one method that we use, a, a secure data lab based in University College London, a location that isn't uh, even marked on the, uh, uh, the campus map and is disconnected from uh, the external uh, world. But we use other methods to, uh, um, uh, 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 to access uh, data under different types of data licensing agreements with the uh, objective of data sharing uh, and synthesis. So, um, so taken together, these initiatives then um, are seeking to recreate uh, if you like, uh, spatial data infrastructures, infrastructures that are fit for purpose and in which uh, the characteristics of individuals that are represented within them are representative of uh, any that, uh, that uh, are excluded. And that's based on the fundamental premise uh, that the clue to the remit of social science is in the title, social, it's about everybody. It's not about self-selecting subgroups of self-selecting subgroups. And we're seeking to you know, relate uh, private sector data sources, the increasing uh, volume and variety of consumer data sources, uh, to uh, 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 other sorts of 
uh, uh, data uh, uh, which uh, are of uh, more clearly defined uh, uh, provenance. And in that, uh, yeah, Alex will uh, uh, shortly show our CDRC map site, which is uh, a data visualization platform. And uh, the other platforms are also used by us in our uh, research. And so uh, this, uh, this slide here, uh, yeah, relating to uh, three of our so-called smart street sensors, uh, 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 not very far from, um, uh, 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 from this, uh, uh, this room, um, uh, 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 seeks to relate um, measures of footfall um, uh, 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 arising from our collaboration with a local data company uh, to um, uh, open data, uh, data made available for transport for London, uh, which allow uh, the aggregate patterns of uh, uh, footfall or the decomposed uh, patterns of footfall to be related to um, uh, 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 the, the temporal profiles of ingress and egress from um, uh, London underground stations and so forth. And so these sorts of, uh, 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 this sort of uh, 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 coupling of private sector data sources with data derived from open platforms and open data allow us to rethink the way that um, uh, cities are structured and cities are function. function. We can begin to think of uh, si uh, the city as the nexus of flows rather than uh, uh, an, is uh, uh, an inert uh, mosaic of residential zones or a, um, a, a semi-inert uh, mosaic of uh, even of workplace zones. In all of that, in all of that, what the social science community is having to uh, 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 come to terms with uh, is that, of course, many, uh, most of these data sources are not created for their own edification. You know, you know, generations of social scientists have been used to you know, specifying the sample design, drawing the inferences, writing, writing the reports. Um, uh, big data, it's fundamental to uh, think of as a byproduct, a byproduct of the uh, provision of goods and services, be they social media serv serv uh, services, as in the case of Twitter, uh, or uh, 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 transactions for groceries or anything like that, as, uh, 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 as captured by, uh, 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 by retailers. And in moving from those sorts of data sources which are focused upon customer transactions and may be used predominantly in a sort of tactical sense towards looking for towards the next quarter's uh, profits forecasts and so forth, towards looking at, the, uh, 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 at them as um, something of um, a, a record of what's going on uh, right across uh, uh, society. Uh, we spend a lot of our time looking at uh, looking at the provenance of um, you know, consumer data sources by seeking to link them uh, to more conventional uh, uh, um, uh, social science uh, uh, um, infrastructures. Uh, and in this respect, we're fundamentally cognizant that it, it doesn't make sense to think about old divisions between public and private sector, you know, sort of the distinctions between uh, you know, the two uh, fundamentally uh, 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 blurred in, uh, uh, in Britain today, um, uh, but nonetheless, linkage of some sources to others uh, can uh, uh, identify commonalities of interest uh, which link the academic sector uh, with, uh, 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 with uh, uh, organisations that uh, produce data. Uh, and so here is just one example taken from uh, um, uh, 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 consumer data analysed by one of our uh, research students and you see on the left hand side a small subset of uh, data uh, mapping a pattern of transactions uh, in relation to um, uh, customers uh, stated residences uh, most, uh, most of which or many of which uh, are incorrect because they've not been updated. And so the right hand of the two diagrams shows how you know, a, a, a fairly rudimentary uh, geographic modelling allows 
Uh, it allows a pattern to be identified, which is of use to the retailer in identifying the genuine locus of activities of uh, their, their customers. But it's of much wider implication uh, when we come to look at uh, activity patterns uh, in general. And so one of the things that Alex would describe uh, that we're very interested in uh, at CDRC um, is looking at uh, residential mobility patterns um, and uh, the associated uh, notions of um, uh, social change that uh, uh, were also part of David uh, Willett's talk earlier. So before I hand over to Alex, I mean, Alex will uh, sort of set out, uh, 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 describe recent developments on our uh, um, uh, maps.cdrc.ac.uk platform. <coughs> and the objective, really, of, you know, uh, uh, of this talk uh, is to uh, engage in a form of sort of consultation. I mean, basically, uh, what we're doing as we um, uh, pass the halfway stage of uh, CDRC's first uh, period of funding is we're be trying to focus on the subset of all of the big data that are available uh, that address issues of uh, widespread uh, concern uh, across uh, uh, government, business and uh, uh, the academic sectors. And in so doing, we're seeking to identify uh, uh, where, uh, but also when. And so this time-space cube that you can see with the outline of Greater London uh, uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the base of it, deliberately doesn't have uh, the clock face calibrated because uh, it, it turns out that in important respects, the different consumer data sources that we uh, it can look at are not only relevant to short-term uh, tactical um, issues of uh, business concern, not only interested to look at uh, of uh, relevance to short-term activity pattern analysis, but also uh, can say something about the uh, much deeper ingrained uh, issues of uh, social mobility and social change that uh, David Willits was talking about in the context of the uh, Resolution Foundation. But in terms of the sorts of uh, uh, measures that we're, we're developing, uh, so here is uh, what, uh, 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 one of our uh, nationwide data sets provided by um, uh, 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 one of, the, uh, one of uh, the UK's domestic energy providers, uh, and what uh, uh, Anastasia Ushakova, another of our PhD students, has uh, looked at is uh, the temporal profiling uh, of different types of uh, household activity patterns. And of course, we can see how all of this is interesting, you know, sort of in terms of you know, energy consumption, and one could think forward in terms of battery technology, electric cars, et cetera, et cetera, and how this might, uh, 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 this might slot into better understanding carbon footprints, um, uh, issues of fuel poverty, uh, issues of energy use. But of course, also more widely, if somebody is at home with the central heating on, they're less likely to be out, uh, out and about. And so this uh, data source uh, is of value uh, viewed alongside the previous one that I showed you of customer loyalty card data in getting some idea of the sorts of horizons that different uh, neighbourhoods have in the short term in terms of their interactions uh, for um, uh, 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 not just for uh, workplace but also for leisure pursuits and uh, 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 other activities. This is some uh, preliminary work uh, uh, looking at the uh, scale of the individual life course that uh, uh, Guy Lansley has been working on, who uh, uh, introduced the master's dissertation scheme before, uh, before the break. And here, uh, we have, uh, yeah, we've concatenated um, uh, uh, public versions of electoral registers from 1998 through to the uh, present day, um, supplemented, by, uh, supplemented by consumer registers devised, uh, 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 derived from a range of different sources. And in an interesting uh, um, uh, foray into big data analysis, have sought to trace individu named individuals uh, throughout the 25-year period with, a, with quite, a high level of, uh, 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 quite a high level of success. 
And Alex will show say, uh, some of the uh, results from that in terms of the way that those data can be used to supplement you know, 10 yearly census es estimates of um, uh, mobility, uh, but also uh, look at it in terms of uh, social change and the characteristics of origins and uh, destinations. Names, it turns out, are also very reliable uh, indicators of cultural, ethnic, linguistic group. Uh, and this slide um, it, it compares uh, census estimates of the uh, census uh, figures on the distribution of the Bangladeshi population in 2011 uh, with uh, est uh, our estimates of the distribution of the Bangladeshi population in 2011 derived from our consumer registers. And uh, to herald you know, what Alex will uh, describe uh, shortly, of course, the strength of this approach is once you've done this uh, for 2011, unlike the census, we can crank it forward for every year at 12 monthly intervals uh, right through uh, to the present day. Not only that, but where uh, census categories are inconvenient, as in the left-hand diagram that you see here being of the white other category uh, uh, from the 2011 census, uh, you can actually decompose it, uh, white other, into uh, yeah, subgroups that may be of interest. And so the graph on the uh, right, uh, sorry, the map on the right-hand side uh, shows, um, uh, shows the distribution of uh, 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 individuals that we identify as being of Greek origin, okay, uh, uh, which shows a different distribution to the one on the left-hand side. Anyone ever been to a Greek restaurant in Thetford? No, I thought not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the, uh, you know, the, uh, the distribution you see on the right-hand side uh, um, is probably a reliable uh, estimate. In a, a, an intergenerational sense, uh, it also turns out that these sorts of consumer registers uh, can be linked not just to obvious, uh, 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 other obvious consumer data sets, uh, but uh, data sets uh, relating to the dim and distant past. And this, uh, this slide takes some of our uh, thinking about um, a, a intergenerational change uh, and uh, the, the, the dynamism of the British economy uh, a step forward uh, by uh, uh, comparing the distribution of um, uh, uh, names as recorded at the individual level in the 1881 census of population with distributions of those same names um, at several generations uh, 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 or two, uh, uh, a couple of generations uh, uh, crank further forward uh, and begins to, uh, 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 begins to look at the extent to which um, different parts of the country uh, have mixes of incomers uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, long settled residents. And we conventionally sort of think about uh, local e economic change and development and population change uh, in, in terms of ethnicity. But what this, uh, yeah, what this uh, 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 figure begins to uh, 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 open up is new ways of thinking about. Uh, 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 the population profiles of areas in terms of mixes of long settled residents uh, and incomers uh, independent of um, a cultural, ethnic and linguistic background. And then finally this slide comes for, uh, again from some, uh, a paper that uh, Guy Lansley and I uh, published a, um, a, a year or so ago now uh, which actually seeks to anchor uh, Twitter data, you know, notoriously slippy, slippery and self-selecting, to some kind of reference distribution. And so here, uh, what we've done again is we've used uh, the characteristic age profiles of popular given names, um, uh, 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 and also, as it turns out, uh, um, uh, geographies of uh, uh, um, uh, uh, and origins of surnames, uh, to uh, infer an age pyramid of the people that tweet at the four locations you can see across uh, the top of that slide. Um, and again, you know, the, the sort of problems that this sort of work uh, 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 opens up is, okay, sure, you can identify that the, um, uh, 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 the age pyramid is different at the different locations and it has different balances of um, females on the left and uh, males on the right. Uh, but 
the question that we do have to ask is, you know, sort of, well, what is the com comparable baseline population? And so you know, what we've done is we've compared it with the age pyramid of uh, Greater London, a residential geography, which may be entirely inappropriate when we actually start to think about trying to identify uh, populations that are on the move in terms of day-to-day um, uh, -day activities. So those are some, uh, those are some illustrations of you know, the way that the, uh, the CDRC uh, is looking at new sources of data and trying to uh, relate them to uh, a conventional uh, social science uh, data infrastructures. One of the other questions that uh, really uh, uh, we have to face is, uh, as I previously alluded, um, we're moving to the situation that, you know, hypothetically, uh, we could... Uh, know the location of anything, any time, any place, anywhere. Um, uh, uh, and representation is necessarily about selectivity and preparation for purpose. And so uh, a, a, a lot of our current uh, research focus in uh, CDRC is to develop indicators uh, which uh, are selective um, and are prepared for a range of different purposes. And the purpose of the second part of this presentation is to look at some of those uh, indicators and uh, to offer them to you. As a, this is really a sneak preview of um, uh, uh, work that we'll be uh, launching over the, uh, uh, over the coming months um, and uh, uh, solicit your opinions as to whether we've done it right and perhaps more importantly, uh, whether what we're doing is uh, salient, interesting and relevant. So over to you, Alex, uh, to describe that. Thanks, Paul. So as Paul mentioned, this is, uh, to an extent, um, part of our sort of ongoing stakeholder uh, consultation. Um, if you'd like to give feedback on any of the, well, any of the talks, but um, in particular the, the, the indicators that I'm going to go through in a second, um, you can use our info at cdrc.ac.uk uh, email address. It'd be helpful if you put in the title of that um, indicator consultation. We've actually got um, a not really widely promoted um, uh, indicators page specifically on the CDR site, uh, on the CDRC site, and the URLs for um, is, is there as well. And again, that gives you some hot links directly to some of the things I'm going to talk about today. Um, there's no particular order to these, but there's a series of indicators I'm going to go through. Um, the first uh, of these uh, relates to some work we've been doing with the local data company, and it's kind of um, a legacy project that kind of emerged out of work um, done in the sort of late 1990s, early 2000s at University College London in the Centre of Advanced Spatial Analysis, of which there's a couple of people here today, uh, specifically looking um, at how you can define town centres. Um, and this work was done with um, the ODPM at the time, uh, later DCLG. Uh, and ostensibly, there is a set of town centre boundaries in existence which relate to a circa sort of 2004. So obviously it's quite a long time ago. Um, and you can see those on the maps. This is actually Allerton Road. This is where I live uh, in South Liverpool um, by these sort of rare, uh, the red um, square polygons. Um, the orange dots you can see on the slide are where the actual retailers are. Uh, and the blue polygons, which are created around this slide, uh, are new definitions <coughs> for retail centres. Um, it's a greatly expanded set from what the 2004 DCLG boundaries are, um, and it used a completely different method. The other thing that we were particularly interested in and why we've done this project, and again, this is based on sort of ongoing discussions which have come through these various Doug meetings we've been attending for um, a great number of years, uh, is creating boundaries that are specifically for retail rather than town centres themselves. So we were interested in the core area of these places where retail happens, not necessarily a broader definition of a town centre which might capture things like office use. Um, Paul mentioned the, um, uh, the CDRC Maps platform, developed uh, primarily by uh, Ollie O'Brien who's in the room. Um, all of the data I'm going to talk about we host through there as a kind of visual window um, there are hot links from uh, what you can see on the maps uh, over to our secondary platform, data.cdrc, uh, which is um, an open data platform where 
uh, for the data sets we can disseminate uh, publicly, you can <coughs> register and you can download the data. The MAPS platform, I think, has had um, sort of about 140,000 users um, since we launched it, uh, which is a very significant number. And if you actually look at the download rates um, for some of the data sets that we hold on our, our CCAM platform, for single data sets, we may have as many as 40,000 downloads since we've launched that. So it's quite a good way in which we're uh, disseminating some of our data. So anyway, back to the, back to the catchments. This is um, Central Swindon. And it's just to illustrate how, how it works. Essentially, you can display where the retail centers are that we've defined. And you can click on these, and you end up seeing the different retail center extents. The other thing that's quite nice about the Maps platform is you can start to layer um, some of these different data sets. So this is uh, Havent, uh, which David Willits mentioned this morning. And we can see there's a the retail center in the core of Havent there. Um, and we can overlay on top of that uh, other sort of CDRC data products. So this is the, um, the uh, ONS um, output area classification, which we developed uh, at UCL with Chris Gale a number of years ago. And you can see here the sort of residential context around that particular retail setting. We can swap it out for other data sets uh, that we pull in. So we don't just display um, our own products that we've built on the CDRC Maps platform. We also bring in other data sets uh, which may be hidden away on other government websites, but we think uh, uh, need, need a bit more promotion uh, and potentially are quite interesting to people. So this was one uh, set of maps which we created which were uh, quite popular around the dwelling age of particular types of property. And again, you can see it there overlaid with the retail centre definitions. So we, we were interested, in obviously, in, in where retail centres were, um, but extending beyond that, uh, we're also interested in who might typically come and shop within those uh, local vicinities. Now, it's quite common, uh, you know, I, I don't work for a retailer, but it's very common for the retailers we talk to um, that you're, you're interested in where your customers live uh, and where they go and shop. Uh, and quite, uh, it's quite prevalent to build uh, catchment models for stores, um, taking into all sorts of different um, characteristics to account, uh, uh, into account, so, you know, different retailer distributions, competitors, uh, local populations and their spending power and so on. What had been done less prevalently when we started looking at this is how you can define um, uh, catchment areas for retail centres themselves, which are obviously a composition of multiple retailers and uses, um, uh, and then there's various other aspects of the retail centres themselves um, that also influence um, whether people will go there Maybe they're attracted to it because it's got leisure um, destinations within, within its locality, or maybe they're not attracted to it as much, perhaps there's quite a lot of vacancy rates or uh, more sort of down market retail, which um, sort of uh, puts people off going there. So essentially, we created a new uh, method of taking some of these considerations into account, um, and we've built a set of uh, convenience catchments, for convenience types of retail, and also um, um, some comparison catchments for comparison retail. And again, you can click um, through on the CDRC Maps platform, and you can see these for the retail centres that we've got definitions for. Uh, I think this is Grimsby. Uh, you can see the retail centre definition here, convenience catchment uh, in blue, and the comparison catchment in green. I'll come on a little bit later about uh, some of the background <coughs> to how we use these data sets and synthesize new, quite interesting social science research problems and investigations on the basis of some of these a little bit later or towards the end of, the, uh, end of my presentation. Okay, so moving on. Paul mentioned um, this work, um, which basically is a synthesis um, as a series of different types of uh, consumer, uh, consumer um, uh, and person registers. So, they come from a variety of different data sets uh, uh, and, and electoral registers, and we, we essentially create a composite of these. Uh, and what we can do with this uh, composite of individual populations is we can look at both characteristics of the individuals themselves, and we'll show some work on uh, our uh, ethnicity um, estimations later on, uh, and then also um, uh, trajectories through these data sets over time, because we've got a, a sort of a longitudinal record. So this, um, I've got two sets of tables here. This one looks at uh, population stability within local authorities. Um, uh, those local authorities between um, sort of now and, and how they were in 2001, uh, those that were most stable 
and those which were least stable. And obviously the least stable ones, as you might um, sort of uh, hypothesize, are mostly in London. There's a very high turnover of populations. But there's some really interesting local authorities in the most stable. So right at the, well, actually there's two there in sort of the uh, Liverpool city region, which I live within. Um, you know, Knowsley is a very interesting example. Knowsley, I think, is the only local authority in the country I read where there's no secondary, um, no post-16 provision. Um, so you can't do A-levels within Knowsley. You have to go to a different borough. So there's lots of things that might be why people don't move out of that vicinity. So anyway, that's 2001 to 2017. You can actually look, because you've got all, all these different time slices, you can actually look at um, uh, uh, other top time periods. So this is, this is fairly current. So this is areas that have been most stable since the 2011 census and areas that have been least stable since the 27, uh, uh, 20, uh, 2011 census. Um, so again, there's some interesting patterns here. If we look at some of the least stable areas, we've got some sort of new towns in there. Um, again, some parts of London. And they start to enable you to hypothesize about why these patterns, uh, these patterns might exist, which again, uh, you know, can stimulate useful sort of social science investigations. So a little bit less um, aggregate uh, than just local authorities. Um, using the MAPS platform, again, we've generated sort of statistics. We can generate statistics for any level of granularity. Uh, in this case, I think it's lower super output areas. Um, and as the map gets darker over time, this is running from 98. Uh, through to 2017, it's showing the stability of the areas. So from now, so basically most different back in time, most similar to now, obviously last year. So again, quite interesting. But even when you actually look at these maps, and we'll actually unpick it a little bit more for Liverpool, so we can look at the change between last year and this year, um, and what does that show you? So what does that show you in the sort of, uh, in the context of Liverpool? Well, you can see these lighter areas here in the sort of centre uh, and, they, uh, and around the sort of bit which is the, the sort of southern part of the centre uh, where the, um, the main terminus of the train lines are. Uh, this is all the, this is, um, there's around sort of um, a, a 20 to 30 percent shift in population there, which is, a, you know, it's an area where there's a lot of rental properties and a lot of students live. Um, so each year populations turn over quite regularly in those areas. So, it does tell you interesting things about a city, even over the short term. Now, we've spent a very long time, um, right since I was doing my PhD uh, with Paul Long at UCL, uh, many years ago, since the sort of mid-2000s, um, collecting very, very large volumes of data about people's names um, and, and where they live, what countries they're from. So we, over the years, we've essentially sem uh, assembled a very large database um, of, what, of, of world names, uh, and we've developed various methods where we can categorize these names into <coughs> either um, a, 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 an estimated sort of ethnicity or um, an estimated origin of where they come from. We've, we've done lots of projects on this, and I've, we've probably presented on this um, before at Doug. Um, linking these to some of the um, sort of longitudinal work that we've been doing, we can start to show some very interesting things. So, this is, um, this is just a, a, a map of uh, Manchester and the location of um, black uh, people who we've got estimate we have, will have um, a, a black African uh, ethnicity on the basis of their name. Then we can change that to Pakistani. And you can see that they are existing in different parts of the city. There's some overlap, um, but there's a generally a slight, different pa uh, a slight difference in the geography of those uh, people with those two types of names. If we link them to the temporal records, we can also show very interesting patterns. So this is, um, again, Liverpool and Manchester. Uh, and we can run the data over time from 98. And what you see is a slow suburbanization of people we estimate to have a Pakistani origin over that time, which is quite an interesting, uh, quite an interesting finding. What's also, I think, quite interesting is it happens to a lesser degree in Liverpool than it does in Manchester. I think that's quite interesting in itself. Um, there's different propensities for people of those populations in the two cities, but nonetheless, they start to make you think about uh, social science research questions that you might want to ask. Okay, so next indicator. Um, We've got a, you know, a wider user base than just um, retailers and people who are perhaps interested in management science. 
uh, and it's a whole sort of um, breadth of social sciences. There's quite a significant group of people who approach us with uh, research questions about um, health and well-being. Um, and on the basis of um, um, some of that feedback, we decided it'd be worth spending some efforts using some of the retailer data to develop some indicators that might be of utility within those different disciplines. And it's not just um, uh, sort of health professionals. It's a whole raft of social science disciplines who are actually interested in health-related problems. So we've developed this indicator called the uh, Access to Healthy Assets and Hazards Index, which is a bit of a mouthful, but to remember it, it's AHA, which is a very deliberate Alan Partridge reference. <laughs> so um, the AHA Index um, takes, it's, it takes a very similar approach to how the Index of Multiple Deprivation was developed. I can see Tom in the room at the back there, so he might see that I've been copying some of his work. Um, it takes uh, inputs from a series of different domains. We look at the physical environment, uh, which is things like access to green space or, or pollutants. Uh, we take stuff about the uh, health environment, the health context of places. So it might be uh, how close you are to GP surgeries or hospitals or, or dentists. Um, and then we also look at the retail environment. So things that might be health negating about the retail environment. Um, a high prevalence of gambling, uh, uh, gambling outlets or lots of takeaways. And there's lots of literature essentially will stitch these things together. Everything we put into the classification, there's a decent body of literature to say it's either health promoting or health negating. And the idea is you're creating a, a, a composite of all these different data types and synthesizing them together into a, an overall index. Some of the data sets that we, we've used are just highlighted by those logos um, on the side of the slide. So London is a terrible place to live. I'll make that an official statement. But um, on our AHA uh, index, um, um, all of the London boroughs um, are very poor places to live. They've got uh, contexts which are very bad for your health. So I encourage you all to move to Liverpool, which is uh, a city in need of a good population growth. Um, anyway, very cheap housing, very green. Um, but we've actually we've ranked here uh, we've ranked here uh, all the locations and we can see them on the Coropleth map as well uh, outside of London, um, which have got um, uh, lower super output areas coded in the sort of worst decile um, uh, of the AHA index, and it's quite interesting. You've got this east of England effect. Um, there's some problems in these localities with access to healthcare in particular, uh, and there's also actually um, not great air quality related to some of the um, uh, agricultural activities that happen within those localities as well. So again, aggregate picture, if you actually look uh, on the CDRC maps platform, you can map both the overall index again. I'm picking on Portsmouth and Havant again here, which actually appears in, on the list as not a particularly great place to live for sort of uh, health. Uh, but you can also, as well as looking at the overall index, which is of interest, you can actually unpick it uh, and all the inputs to the classification uh, are in there as well. So this is actually really helpful. So some of our engagement with local authorities, um, you know, we've picked out that we've missed, I forget which locality it was, it might have been Cambridgeshire, there was one hospital missing out of our data set, so they were a bit upset because actually their health context was a lot better than we said, so we can add that back in um, uh, in the next iteration. So we can actually improve the classification by having it out in the public domain. So this, this is uh, access to fast food outlets. Uh, we've got uh, access to gambling outlets, uh, access to leisure services. So, you know, it's great if you've got lots of gyms. Um, Portsmouth has got quite a few. South Hailing's got very few. Um, so light is uh, more. Dark green would be not that many. Uh, then we've got the obviously health data as well. So this is uh, access to GPs, and you can see the the, the geography of GPs within this uh, in, in this area as well um, is is very variable. So it's all these things together that create this sort of overall index. And we're working with various partners about how we can uh, push this index into sort of public health applications. So we've had some early meetings uh, with sort of Public Health England about how we might append it to some of their surveys and tools that the local authorities are using there. Uh, and their sort of health, um, uh, health service planning. Uh, next classification, internet user classification. This has been um, an ongoing project since we started the CDRC. Uh, we've had one iteration of this classification, which is the one you can see on the map, um, uh, which is actually in a, in a book that we're going to release about some of the CDRC projects um, sort of in the new year. Um, 
but it's also one of the classifications that we're actually in the process of updating at the minute. It wasn't quite ready uh, to the point where we wanted to disseminate it today, but probably between, between now and Christmas it will be ready and we'll be re releasing a new version. So as it stands, this is a couple of years old, but it's a geodemographic classification we built um, specifically looking at um, uh, internet user behaviour. And it's something that spins out of work that Paul and I did um, a very long time ago, looking at this idea of digital deprivation. So rather than saying that people either use the internet or don't, there's this much more, um, uh, it's a much more varied approach, uh, which says there's all sorts of different types of internet behaviour, uh, which is constrained both by uh, how people engage with the technology and also whether the technology and the infrastructure is available to them. So... These are the two sides of things that we essentially uh, put together in this geodemographic. Um, some of the data that we use, Oxford Internet Survey, uh, we use some data about infrastructure for SAM knows, so where telephone exchanges are. We had uh, broadband speed uh, data. Uh, we use data from Ofcom about sort of 3G signal provision. <coughs> and then other sort of demographic data uh, from the Office of National Statistics as well. We synthesized that all together and we created geodemographic. And again, it's one of those classifications you can see um, uh, you can see on the CDRC maps platform. Um, two examples of, of places with quite different um, internet user behavior. Uh, this is, uh, is Reading. Uh, we've got um, central Reading in this sort of light blue color uh, and, re and red. Uh, blue and red are sort of the most engaged groups. Uh, people are very likely to be using um, uh, the internet for all sorts of different activities in their lives. Uh, we compare that to St Helens, which is one of those people I've placed I've flagged earlier on. It's very different. There's a small nugget um, in the centre of St Helens, which is engaged around the town centre. Um, very good provision. Um, the thing that's quite interesting is the light green area around the edge um, is, uh, and, and as you get out into the suburbs, Although there is decent provision there, people are really not that engaged with it. And there's two types of behavior that you see. Essentially, there are people who would love to engage with the internet, but can't because the infrastructure is too poor. And then there's people who don't engage with the internet um, uh, just because they don't want to, and they don't see their relevance. And actually for, well, for a whole raft of different uh, applications, understanding those behaviors, whether it's context or uh, individuals, uh, it's quite important of how you actually stimulate responses that you want, be it to purchase project, uh, products online or maybe use uh, the internet, for example, for provision of public services. We found this has been a very popular project. This gets a lot of, um, a lot of interest. Final couple of slides um, before I finish. Um, these are sort of fairly disparate different things. We... Uh, have been interested in both um, individually as, uh, as academic researchers, but also uh, derived from sort of stakeholder con uh, uh, conversations that we have at events like this. Um, one of the things I think which is uh, very powerful is when you start to put these different data sets uh, together uh, and start to do really innovative, um, uh, really innovative uh, social science research projects, which are quite cutting edge because these assets haven't existed uh, previously. And this is something actually that Paul uh, told me about, which emerged out of uh, combining some of the names work and some of the temporal um, uh, profiling work um, uh, yesterday. So I thought we'd put a slide together on it. And it specifically looks um, on the borders of Tower Hamlets. And that green, uh, sorry, the, the blue um, uh, icon you can see uh, on the screen. <coughs> I don't know if I've got a, I'm not sure that's a pointer, but um, on uh, the, the, blue, the blue icon you can see is Shoreditch High, um, uh, uh, Shoreditch High, High Street. Uh, and actually, if you zoom in there, um, which I'll do in a second, um, you can actually see that the population of people who we estimate as being Bangladeshi has fallen from around 50% uh, to around 20% over that time period. And it's also been a time period uh, from 98 uh, through to now uh, where well, there's been quite significant gentrification within that area. So there's been a significant uh, change to the built environment and those people who may typically live within that locality. Um, and that may, and again, this isn't explanatory, it's uh, purely descriptive, but it asks interesting questions. And I think that's really what a lot of these data sets are doing. They're enabled to frame interesting questions which warrant further investigation. So the second uh, application... Um, which we spent the um, past couple of years working on, 
is to uh, fuse both. If we know the characteristics of um, and location of a retail centre, uh, so we know the types of stores are within a retail centre, if we can use some of our catchment estimation techniques to work out the probable types of people who may go and use those, um, those particular localities, and we know something about the uh, internet user behaviour of those people, we can balance these two things together to create a measure for each retail centre, which gives you an idea of how exposed it is uh, to people who would be likely to be shopping online. So this idea is that some uh, contexts are very resilient, some contexts are very unresilient. Um, there's two examples here, classic things uh, that you may no longer see on high streets are sort of record shops uh, and bookshops. Um, they've been uh, heavily impacted by um, uh, converting of their, their, sa their saleable assets um, uh, online. Uh, so there's less of a reason for people to go in and shop. Now, if you've got a bookshop and you're in an area where no one shops online, you're probably fine. If you've got a bookshop where everyone sh shops online, uh, particularly those who are very engaged and maybe they really like e-books rather than physical books, uh, you may have a problem. Um, so it's a balance between the context of the retail and the types of behaviours that surround that retail. And we actually create an index for this, which on this map it looks sort of like a space constellation. Um, and the uh, larger white dots are the ones which are um, uh, 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 less resilient. Um, and they've highlighted the ones that are above the mean for that and, um, in red. And actually what you find out is the, store, the, the localities which are, have the most problem are those ones where the retail offering itself is fairly undifferentiated. It's not like a small specialist retail centre. It's a fairly generic, um, to use the term which is popularised as clone town. Um, they're not necessarily in the core of the main sort of urban conurbations. Uh, they're around the periphery um, and they've not got such a defined um, uh, use as some of the smaller and more specialised centres. So that's all written up. But we'll be updating this as soon uh, with the new internet user classification when that arrives as well. So, final slide. Um, as I said, it's sort of a... Um, that was a sort of brief overview of some of the things that are ready to go now, a sort of soft launch for those, if you like. Um, but there's also a lot of activities going on at the moment, um, uh, or are planned, uh, which will deliver a number of other indicators. Um, so the first of these, which actually has been built at the minute, uh, is a retail centre typology. So, um, as I said, we know a little bit about um, who goes to retail centres and what the composition of the retail centres are. But we're fusing a whole uh, host of data about those retail contexts together to create a multi-dimensional typology of different types of retail settings on the basis of the uh, retail centres that we've defined. So that's ongoing at the moment, working with Jonathan at Oxford on that. Um, we've got uh, a little bit more work to do on some fairly um, uh, sophisticated data mining of our global names database. So we're hoping probably in the new year to have a new uh, global names classification, which should have uh, much uh, broader um, uh, um, uh, uh, granularity than just uh, eth ethnic groups. It will actually look specifically at countries of origin. So again, we're hoping that will lead to some um, quite interesting insights about sort of um, the geography of uh, 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 of cultural, ethnic and linguistic origins across the UK and over time. Um, Internet user classification 2018, which I mentioned, uh, again, also linking that along to an update to the e-resilience index. We've been doing some work which is not launched, I don't think, until later in the month uh, with the Greater London Authority, looking at creating an extension of an ONS product, which I don't actually think is launched yet either, uh, which is a classification of workplace zones. So that's essentially is like the output area classification, but using the workplace zone geography. Um, if you want to talk a bit more about that, Dave Martin's in the room, or I know he's had some uh, involvement in that particular project. Um, we're also interested in using some of the uh, footfall data, um, which we've been collecting over the past year, and Paul mentioned that in some of his slides, um, with the retail centre data and our retail centre typology um, to create some footfall indexes for retail centres, but also clusters of retail centres in their context. So we've got some plans for that. Uh, and then obviously any product that we've got at the moment, so our AHA index, for example, we're also going to plan some sort of updates for those. AHA, it's likely we'll do an update next summer, sort of its 12-month anniversary, for example. 
So that's all we've got. The, I was told to remind everyone, vote for your posters. Um, everyone apparently gets one vote each, so no cheating or rigging it by voting for your own institution if you happen to have a lot of people here. Um, and um, other point would be, again, as I said at the start, and as Paul, uh, Paul said as well, it'd be great to have some feedback on these. Um, there are people outside um, in the breaks doing demonstrations uh, on iPads, so you can, if you want to go and have a look at the maps now, you can do. Um, I'm told they also work on mobile phones and tablets, if you happen to have those in your bag um, uh, sort of during the talks. <laughs> or not during the talks, in the breaks, shall I say. All right, thank you very much. Cheers. Great. Just to warn you, when it comes to voting, there are one or two experts in fraud detection in the room as well. <laughs> but anyway, th thanks very much. I really love the indicator projects. I think it's a great way of the, uh, the academic sector also creating products that engage and are usable within the commercial sector. So it's a really helpful, practical group. But I'm going to shut up now because I've already made you late for your lunch. So enjoy the meal and see you again at 2 o'clock. Thank you. <laughs>